Okay, welcome back. Obviously I've already written this program, but I will be including the entire project in the description as a GitHub link. I encourage you to download it, tinker with it, break it in different ways, come up with some ideas. This is really how we learn things in the end. And I apologize for the fact that this was supposed to look like planet Earth, but it's all warped and stuff. I just kind of threw the texture in there. If you're curious, it is Creative Commons, though. It's from publicdomainpictures.net. Uh, what you would have to do to align this is to look at the UV alignment and manage it by that. But that's going to be well outside of our topic today. So this is our almost planet Earth. Let's begin with our nodes. I created a 3D scene here and just named it World, as is my custom. Uh, and our main script is attached to this. The only other major script in here is for our satellite and our target. The target one is very small, too. Within it, we've got universe settings, which are just to make it a little more um, appealing to the eye, which includes a world environment with a sky set up to be a procedural sky, and a directional light, which is effectively your sun here. We also have a camera pivot, which is very specifically and intentionally at the origin. And the camera is a child of that. That way when we rotate the camera pivot, the camera rotates with it, which will be part of our controls. It's a quality of life thing, more than anything. Skipping past that to our planet, the planet is simply a static body in this instance with a Mesh Instance 3D, which is just your default sphere with that same Creative Commons material wrapped around it, and a collision shape, which I generated with Mesh Create Single Convex Collision Sibling. Could probably be simpler, but that's easy enough, and I'm sure this is running fine for most people. Now, Satellite is what's actually going to be traveling along the planet to our mouse clicks. It's relatively simple. I made it a character body instead of a rigid body. Sorry, not rigid body, static body. I was just thinking, wait, if it's a rigid body, why isn't it falling? It's... <laughs> but we do want this to move, so I went with a character body for it. Uh, for people coming from other engines, you can think of that as a kinematic body, which is basically what it is. Godot decided for whatever the reason to call it a character body, and I'm rolling with that. The mesh instance is simply a red ball. Radius 0.1, I'm sorry, height 0.1, radius 0.05, and we get that nice little ball there. With the same generated collision shape around it. The biggest reason here is planet is meant to be fixed in space. I don't want to waste any CPU cycles on something which will not happen. So it is static. Character body is meant to move. So character body gets to be a kinematic. Jumping into world, which was the first thing I wrote, as it kind of sets up the environment. We have a few elements in here, two major sections, but let's look at the beginning of it first. It extends Node 3D, of course, so we get all of those functions in there, but we only really need a few of them. Uh, I exported the camera so that I could simply drag it in and not worry about moving it later, which was good because I ultimately did end up giving it a pivot later on. So once you've done that, be sure to drag your camera from here into its specific location in the inspector. Otherwise, it's not going to see your camera and it's going to freak out. For on ready, we grab the direct space state because I didn't like doing it every time the user clicked. It would probably be fine that way, but ethics are important to me. So, we also have a scene produced for our target. I'm going to open that up right now just to show you that there's nothing special about it. Target is just a static body since we won't be moving it, we'll just be instantiating it with a mesh instance and a collision shape, same as before. Mesh instance has a bit of a glow on its material, otherwise black, and a timer set to one second. 
after that timer times out, it calls one function in target, and this is all this really here is here for, which calls Q3 on it. One thing I would like to see Godot implement eventually is just having the ability to call Q3, but I haven't figured out how to do anything like that. It may be a lack of research on my part, but uh, this is all this is really for, just so it doesn't stick around forever. Jumping back over here. We grab our camera pivot right away, because that's what we're going to be rotating if you have the middle mouse button down. Now for unhandled input, this is a function which gets called in Godot every time there's an input event. Just defining it is basically enough to say, listen for that event. And we don't really know what the event is yet. It's an old function. I'm not sure it's even entirely um, static parameter, a static type parameter yet. So the first thing we do is check. Now, by the definition of this program, when you left-click the mouse, I want to cast a ray from the camera and see where it hit on that globe. I've got a little debug statement here we don't strictly need. It just tells me that I detected the button click. It's fine to do that early on when you want to make sure that your situation is right before you start writing an algorithm. And after that, we also check to see if the mouse button on the left has been clicked, just in case it happens to be the middle mouse button. From here, this is a relatively standard method of casting a ray. Uh, we first get our mouse position. Viewport will give you that with get mouse position. And once we have that mouse position, given we've got our camera, this is where it's going to freak out if you didn't assign your camera properly. Project Ray Origin will take that position of the mouse and give you the appropriate origin for a ray cast from it. So that's going to be our starting point for this ray cast. The end point is going to start from that starting point, but it projects out along the um, frustrum of the camera. So it would be one vector plus another. The angle of it is going to be project ray normal on the same camera with the same mouse position. Then we need to tell it how far to go. Now, usually people will just type in something like a thousand here, and that'll totally work. This is more being pedantic for me than anything. Uh, I just went with the camera's far plane, so you're only clicking on things that you can see. You might have other choices there. It's entirely up to you. After that, Godot 4 introduced a compacted version of the Raycast using a specific object type designed to carry all the specifications for the Ray, where it starts, where it ends, things like that. We need a very basic one here. It's called a Physics Ray Query Parameters 3D. The two parameters which must go into it are the beginning of the Ray and the end. So that's why we have origin and then end. If it intersects anything, which we, is where we bring our space state in, actually. Intersect ray is part of the direct space state, the world 3D. All that code is in there. And you just pass it the query now. This used to be a much larger function. And capture the result. The result should always be a dictionary. Because there's a lot of information we might want to get about where it hit. Uh, we might want to know the normal in case we're reflecting something off of it. Um, the position, the name of the collider, it's all in there. Um, in fact, it surprises me that this runs as fast as it does, as much as it depends on a dictionary. So, kudos to the programming team for that. But ne next question is, what do we check exactly to see whether or not result um, was from us clicking an object or just clicking out into empty space? There's two ways to do that. The way I like to do it is the more explicit if not result dot is empty because it asserts that result is a dictionary this is admittedly me being weird though because you could also do do if result and you will get the same behavior however that feels a little odd to me that that works at all because normally it would at worst check to see whether it's null and an empty dictionary is not null so this is my personal preference but if you want to use if result, there's nothing specifically wrong with that. 
And what that would actually mean is that we actually do have data in there from the result. In other words, it actually did hit something. In this case, we know it is our planet because that's the only thing we put in there that you could possibly click. Unless maybe you clicked on the ball itself. So, first thing we do is I want to indicate to people where they clicked exactly. Not everybody has the same pointing device. More and more people are using controllers on their computer. A lot of us, myself included, have graphics tablets. So they may not always have a cursor in front of them. What this does is it takes our target scene and uh, instantiates the scene as a node, then adds a child node, which is that new scene. So everything we had over here in target gets built into our scene and then added to it. Right after that, we set its global position, which is its position to the whole world, not just as parent, to a field in result called position. Now to give you an idea, you could also do this for that value, and you would get the same thing. It's similar to JavaScript in that sense. I prefer dot notation, so that's why we did it this way. You may be different. For me, the spell check goes a long way, but... After that, we set the target position of our satellite. Now, I don't want you to read too much into this yet, because I actually have a setter on target point. We've got further processing going on in there, but that is a different script, and I want to handle these one at a time. But I want you to know that this does, even though it's not intuitive from how it's written. Is it sets the V1 of our satellite's interpolation to the position we just clicked on. But in doing that, it also gets a notification that it needs to set V0 to wherever it is now, not where it's coming from. And also reset T, which I'll remind you is the bounded distance between V0 and V1 that we want to confine it to along this arc. The rest of these were largely quality of life. But if there's a mouse motion and you happen to have the middle button pressed, I grab that input event mouse motion as a motion. Again, just me loving the uh, autofill. And rotating our pivot by it. Now I remind you the pivot is what the camera 3D is under. It's offset. So basically this orbits the camera back and forth and up and down. And This is honestly a terrible way to do it if I'm completely honest with you. But I want to give people the ability to actually scroll around the planet so they can experiment. Lastly, since this means I'm going to be screwing with its transform quite a bit along two axes, which in retrospect are not the best choice of axes, this probably should have been done with sphere coordinates again, but I just wanted to get this done. I'm doing something like Blender and Krita. If you hit your numpad 5, it should totally reset your transform to the identity, and you will be right back where you were at the beginning. Transform.identity means don't do anything to it, leave it like it is. That's what we would want there. In other words, throw out all that rotation or anything else we did. So let's look at satellite. I think I explained these reasonably well, but if we jump to satellite, we've got a little bit of extra material here, including our slurp function. I'll come to that at the end. I gave it a class name in this instance because I wasn't sure I would just need only one, or maybe you guys will want to instantiate more of them. And I have T as a global field here for, I should re, I shouldn't say global here, a class scoped field. It's not truly global. You can't access it from outside. Uh, generally constrained from zero to one. Feel free to throw it outside of that if you want to experiment. And after we're ready and we know we're in the tree, it's important to have that here. It's going to crash your game. I set our start point to be equal to the current global position, just to get that out of the way. In other words, the start point contains where the start of our arc is in world space. But you know, we don't just need that, we also need our target point, where we're going to. Very important. So that's also a vector 3, which I've left unset here, and what this does in Godot, since a vector 3 is not that different from a primitive here, 
it doesn't make sense to try and set it to null. That has no meaning for a primitive. Null is for pointers, it's for objects, complicated things. A vector 3 is simply a number of floating points chained together. So when you create it, it is vector 3.0, or all zeros. This is another thing I get a little concerned about myself, though it's tolerable. Vector 3.0 counts as false when you treat it as a boolean. It's a quirk of the language. There's no such thing as a null vector 3. And there's good reason for that. It really helps with memory management. So it starts out at vector 3.0, or the origin, the core of the planet, if you will, which is recognized as total nonsense for pathfinding. When it's set to a value, obviously the first thing I'm going to do is actually set it to that value to get it out of the way, but we know that a specific change happened, and I figured this is the most efficient way to implement the rest of it. We don't want to interpolate from our old starting point. We want to interpolate from where we are, right where this signal comes in. So starting point is once again set to self.globalPosition. Moreover, we don't want to end up jumping into the middle of that arc. We want it to be at the beginning again. So t is reset to 0.0. .0. Those are the three fields you're going to need for this. Let's jump further down to our process function, which does a lot of the heavy lifting. In fact, I can go ahead and make this a floating point. So that's truly a static function. Again, I'm sure it runs fine either way, but just out of principle. First thing we do is we check if we have a valid target point. If target point's equal to vector 3.0, that counts as being false to GDScript. That's not always true in every language. So um, if you're using a different engine, feel free to compare it to your set value or uh, for a no target point. Um, or to null if it's actually an object. First thing we do is we increment t, of course, so that we're uh, transporting our satellite to a position further along the arc. I'm just having it move at, move at the speed of delta, which is just our change in time, so it would be one arc per second here. You might multiply it by some speed factor, to attempt to improve that by, if you wanted to make things move a little faster if you wanted, but there's was no real point in it here. I'm leaving that to you guys. Next thing we need to check, now that we've incremented t before we move anything, is did we reach our target? You'll remember we reach v1 when t is equal to 1 for any, interpre any interpolation. So if t is greater than 1.0, in fact, let's make this greater than or equal, just to be pedantic again. If that happens, we set t back to zero. We don't want to be going through target point again, because we no longer have a valid target point. So we'll set our start point to target point. In other words, v0 should be where v1 was. We are on a whole new arc now and then invalidate the target point by setting it to zero. Again, this is a quirk of GD script. You would do it a little differently in different languages. You just want to make sure that it doesn't pass this if statement until you have it set to a normal, acceptable value. After all of that is done, we've incremented t. We've checked to see if we've reached the end of the arc. In every single case, and this is all kind of building towards this, we want our global position to be the slurp, and I remind you we're going to have to define this function ourselves right now, but we'll come back to it in just a moment. Between start point and target point by distance t. So this is moving along that arc between start point and target point. t distance. So coming down to our slurp definition, which is not that long. It might look a little intimidating, but again, I'm going to walk you through it. First thing we want to get is our omega, which is the arc cos of p0 dot p1, or v0 dot v1, if you will. I used a p here, but it's the same thing. Uh, what is a dot product? It's basically taking the x-coordinate 
multiplying it by the x coordinate, then adding the y coordinate times the y coordinate, then the z coordinate times the z coordinate. And summing, just sum them all together. And what you end up looking at is the cosine of the angle times a certain factor, which is going to be 1 if it's normalized. So we take the dot product between the two normalized points, just in case we did something strange with our geometry. And that's what we get for omega here. What is omega? Just like our formula. I split it into three lines for readability here. But it's the sine of the quantity of 1 minus t. And I remind you, the t is the fraction we're at between uh, the first point and the second. Times omega, which is the arc distance. And that's important because that makes it something that sine can read times your first point, and then we add the sine of just t here, which is the other half, times omega, multiply all of that by p1, our second point, you know, our target, I should say. And the only issue with this is it's not normalized by its distance, so we divide it by the maximum value for that sine, which is sine of omega, and just get back into normal uh, linear interpolation thinking again. So every time we feed t into this with the same p0 and the same p1, we're going to be moving along a sphere in the shortest distance between the two. And I will demonstrate that again for you right now. Let's start this up. So middle mouse button lets you move back and forth. I'm not totally satisfied with the control, but it should work well enough. 5 recenters you. And clicking on the sphere will instantiate that little blue ball to show us where we clicked and cause effectively a one second interpolation along the surface of our planet here of our satellite from one to the other. If you interrupt it in the middle. Uh, this works fine because we reset everything when we do that. T becomes zero start position becomes the current position and it will always find the shortest distance between the two there's another method of this involving quaternions if you understand those which is also very simple but that wasn't really what we were using here and I'm going to attempt to avoid it for now because honestly as cool as quaternions are they're kind of their own thing so that's how you do it Who knows, maybe I'll see something this inspires in the next Godot Wild Jam or something. Uh, again, I'm going to put all of the source code for this project onto GitHub, and we'll link you to it in the description. Thank you for watching, and if you appreciate to uh, tutorials like this, do remember to like and subscribe. I don't do them that often, but every now and then we just need a clarification on things. Have a great afternoon, everybody.